All right, open your Bibles, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Y'all ready? Tonight I want to share a message with you. And some Wednesday nights it may not even have a title. But the overall title of this message is, The Cross Has Made Me Flawless. Say that with me. The cross has made me flawless. Everybody say grace. Abundance of grace. Glorious grace has made me flawless. Look the person beside you and say, your skin looks better already. I think my face is clearing up. Wrinkle free. I'm flipping channels and it says, do you have turkey neck? And I turn the channel. I don't even watch that. How to have flawless skin. I'm like, I ain't even watching that. I, I did a video today. How many of y'all are Facebook friends? You saw my Facebook video? Share those things. Quit looking at them. Share them. Those are commercials, man. And uh, so I, I, I looked at that just, before, just as I got in the car to see if people were sharing it. And several hundred people have seen it and only five people shared it. Share it. That's how you get people to invite them to come. That's why I share those things. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking to other people through you. And that's why God does stuff. And uh, I looked at it just before I got in the car. As I was stepping in the car, I went, Dang. I need better lighting or makeup or something. So what I said to myself, I just said, man, man, it's bad. When you stand out on the porch, it shows every flaw. Anybody, everybody know what I'm talking about? Turkey necks, raise your hand. Come on. All right, so let's look at this. We're going to go literally verse by verse. Now, if you haven't been with us for a number of years, we have studied the Gospel of John, the book of Acts, some of the epistles, uh, verse by verse. And so we get in no hurry. This is called Bible study. So I may jump up and preach, but we're going to try to do Bible study. So we're just going to study this together. Everybody have a Bible. Everybody have a Bible. Listen, don't depend on the screens. Bring your Bible. Get you a light-up Bible. And if you don't have a light-up Bible, see somebody. Somebody gave me a pen. Mark, 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 back there. Mark gave me a pen uh, from their company, and the end of it lights up. So you don't have to turn the lights on in the dark. If you want to take a note, you just turn the pen on, and you can write in the dark because the end of the pen lights up. Isn't that cool? Get you a light-up Bible. Everybody say, the Word of God is the light of my life. All right, so let's look at it. Paul, and we are literally going to segment this thing right down, uh, just literally, word by word. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. All right? Called to be an apostle. Everybody say, servant. You're not qualified to lead if you're not willing to follow. Being a servant... Jesus said is what qualifies you to be great in the kingdom. So one of the qualifications for Paul to become an apostle, called to be an apostle, is he's a servant of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, I'm a servant. Moses is not referred to God as a leader. Moses, my servant. So let's stop there and think about this great thing called servanthood because I think a lot of people think they're above serving. They think that servants are something that's beneath them. Paul is a servant. What did Jesus do at that Lord's Supper? That, you know, the supper where the, where the guy painted the picture? So what did Jesus do at that supper? He washed the disciples' feet. And he said, now, as you've seen me do, what did he say? You go do it too. So what did he do? He said, now, you go do likewise. And Shelby and I attended a church, Janet. Uh, we attended a church where about once a year, the men would all go to a room, and a lot of men stayed home, seriously. And we did what? We took a pail, and we washed one another's feet. And the ladies went to their room, and they did the same thing. I said, oh, my God, I hope you're not one of those kind of churches. I just sprinkle stuff, you know. You know, now you're talking about washing feet. Oh, my God. You know, that's just way too much, isn't it? That's way too much for a lot of people. But that's what Jesus said do. Jesus said, the way you've seen me, and what was he doing? He was modeling, he was modeling servanthood. And if you read the Bible, uh, there's an entire chapter in the book of Isaiah that's nothing but a, a prophetic passage of Scripture. The whole chapter is the model of Jesus, the servant of God. How many of you love Jesus, the Son of God? He was the servant of God. He said, Father, it's not my will, but thy will be done. So Paul is a servant. Everybody say, I'm a servant. Hey, this thing's working great now. Thank you. Called to be an apostle. So here's, here's the first thing I want you to know. If you believe God has something in whatever definition that you choose to believe is great in you serving God, it starts by being a servant. I was watching a guy. Does anybody here know of Jerry Savelle? 
Raise your hand if you know Jerry Savell. I, I, many years ago, about 1980, volunteered to drive the van during what we called camp meeting. Y'all remember when we called things camp meeting? Baptists, we called them revivals. Methodists, we called them lay witness renewals. Uh, and I, I picked up the guest speakers in the van. I took a week vacation, and I picked them up at the hotel. I picked them up at the airport, took them to the hotel, carried all their luggage. Guys, those people, oh, my God. You know, the guys had a little shave kit, and their wives had, like, four suitcases. And that's back when you could take a suitcase, you put a big old ape in it. I mean, I'm talking some stuff. It, it was hard. And, I, and then I would pick them up and take them to the meetings. And I got me one of them pump things where you could put water or tea or lemonade in there. And, I, man, I'm, I'm opening the door, and I'm taking care of them. And, and I've got them. Would you, like, would you like some iced tea? I have sweet tea. I have unsweet tea. You know, and I'm serving these guys because I'm honored to be able to be with them. I'm seeing them before they preach and after they preach, before God does anything and after God's doing stuff. I saw them preparing and, and how they talk to their wives. And, I, and I, I thought that's great. I did that for... Uh, three years, well, two years, and on the third year, I couldn't do it because I'd been put on staff and I had responsibilities at the meetings. Jerry Savelle walked in, and I watched him last night on TV, preaching the Word of God, and he said, uh, Hey, Perry, how are you? I, I missed you in the van. I went, Dude, he knows my name. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Look at the person and said, Pastor, it's cool. But why did he know me? Because I served him. Because I, I was honored to be able to be a part of the meeting behind the scenes. Now, let me tell you what happened at lunchtime. I'd take them to lunch to the restaurant. And I'd drop them all off, and they'd all go in and eat. You know what I did? Sit in the van. You know why? Because I was a servant. I wasn't one of the ministers there. I was just one of the servants. Would you all like me to have Jerry here? Yes. Too bad. Okay. <laughs> Who else would you like me to have here? Bob White. Todd White? I don't know about Todd. Y'all know Todd White? Woo! People think I'm different. Y'all know who Todd White is? Google it. Not right now. Later. Todd is a little, he's stronger than garlic. Y'all think I'm caloric? Mm -mm. I'm sugar and spice and everything nice. Is that true? That's true. Thank you. What was they supposed to do? Say no. <clears throat> so everybody say a servant. And we're not going to get far because the purpose of Bible study is not to get far. See, the problem is too many times we read the Bible and our whole goal of reading the Bible is to read our five chapters. We read our five chapters. We never slow down and allow the Spirit of God to show us anything because we've got to read our five chapters or we feel guilty. How many of you read five chapters today? Nobody. You're guilty. <laughs> Called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel. Raise your hand if you're separated under the gospel. So this doesn't just apply to an apostle, but Paul was a Pharisee, and the word Pharisee literally means to be separated. But Paul is now not saying, I'm separated under the law, I'm separated simply under Jehovah. Paul's saying, I'm separated under what? Good news. Good news. Now remember a phrase that I said Sunday, and this is one of those phrases y'all need to type down, share it on Facebook, and give me credit for it. When you fail... Your mind and the condemner, the accuser of the brethren will say you deserve hell. But when you fail, because of grace, you need to come to the well, and that's the living water of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, thank God for grace. So you are a servant. You may not be called to be an apostle, but there is no one in this room does not have some sort of a calling. I hate it when people do that, but I just did it. Some sort of a calling. Some sort of a calling. <laughs> Those are just bigger these. That's all that was. That's bigger these. Some sort of a calling in your life. And I, I'm willing to buy into this for myself. That if you're called to be a businessman or a business person or an educator or, or whatever it is that you're called in your vocation, I believe that is equal to the calling. Now, there's different levels of responsibilities and perhaps even different levels of reward. But I don't believe just because I'm a preacher, I get some greater reward than you. What I do get is a greater responsibility. The Bible says that one who teaches call, falls under a greater level of judgment. Why? Because people listen to what I say. Some people choose to believe what I tell them. And so I'm accountable for my words. 
But if you are called to be a business person, you're not less a Christian than, than the apostle. Even though we call them saints, you know, St. John, St. James. You're, you're being faithful to what God's called you to do. God does not judge you by the calling of my life to be a pastor or a founder or whatever it is you may think I am, a pastor, teacher. God, God holds you accountable to fulfill His purpose in your life. You know what that does? That liberates you. That liberates you. It's kind of like tithing. Tithing on a million dollars may be 100000 but it's equal to tithing for a child or a teenager tithing a dollar on ten. It's still tithing. So the equality in the eyes of God is we're all servants of God. Now, we do have to separate the the organization of the church, which is the fivefold offices, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, there is a responsibility in the church organizationally. You know, when there was a discussion about what Paul was teaching, he went to Jerusalem and spoke with the apostles, and he received their blessing. And so we're not talking about organization. We're talking about personal calling, personal Intimate access to, G, uh, to God through Jesus Christ. We all have equal access. Somebody say, well, I know God answers your prayer because you're a man of the cloth. I said, not really. It's polyester. Uh, so uh, I want you to think about this. We are all servants of Jesus Christ. We all have a calling. And we're all, everybody say all. Me, 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 me. Separated unto this good work, this gospel. Now, this is the gospel of God. All right, let's stop. Paul spent three and a half years in the presence of an open vision of Jesus teaching him grace. Paul did not come preaching his own gospel. Beware when somebody comes giving you a new personal revelation. Their revelation or one that just for you. Beware. Be cautious. Be wise. Paul did not come preaching a new gospel. Paul's actually the one penning in the Holy Spirit. said, even if an angel of light or an angel masquerading as an angel of light come preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. This gospel Paul's preaching is not a different gospel. It's not a unique gospel. It is the gospel of God. The story of the book of Romans, this long epistle of the book of Romans was most likely written by the apostle Paul from Corinth. Janet and I, you know, some years ago, uh, we had the privilege of being in Corinth in the marketplace where Paul preached. And while Paul was there for some 90 plus days, they believe this is where Paul wrote this because he was en route to Rome. And in that day, being a Christian was not popular. Kind of like today, only worse. And so the Apostle Paul is writing them saying, I'm coming to you. I wanted to come to you. I've been hindered from coming to you, but I'm coming, so I'm sending you this letter so that when I get there, if even I get there, this letter will be there in your presence. And then this letter, most, most scholars believe, circulated around the church. And let me explain real simply as we get into a true Bible study. If you will please adjust your thinking, this is going to help you a lot. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you have, obviously, at the end of those books, the crucifixion, the declaration of the, of the Great Commission to the church. Then you have the book of Acts, where the Spirit of God is poured out throughout many different demographics, groups of people, declaring that God is including the Gentiles into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on every demographic. All right? That's not simply saying God's including them. God's saying this is for everybody. Just read Acts 2, 37, 38. This gift of the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to as many as the Lord thy God shall call. He's still calling people. How many people here today or tonight have been saved in the past year? How many, there you go. How many has been saved here in the last two years? Somewhere you've been saved for the last two years. So God's still calling people. The last five years. The last ten. How many people in here saved? So he's still calling people, right? He's still calling people. So he's still pouring out his spirit. Anybody who's told you God's no longer pouring out his spirit have not bothered to read the Bible. They've read something else. And let me go ahead and tell you this. There is nothing else you need to read. That's fine to read. But the commentaries are not the Word of God. The Bible's the Word of God. I judge the commentary by the Bible. I judge my life by the Bible. 
So as we study the Bible, let's make sure we stick with the Bible. And the greatest commentary on the Bible would be the Bible. And you don't build any theology or any doctrine on a piece of a verse or your favorite verse or one verse. The Bible is the full gospel, F-U-L-L. And if you build it on pieces by pieces, it's F-O-O-L. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. This is God's gospel. Remember, as we've studied scriptures in the past, God, according to Romans chapter 5, reconciled the world. God reconciled the world. That means God did what's necessary for us to have a relationship with him. God reconciled the world to himself. How many of you were in the world when you got saved? So God looked out and did what was necessary to reconcile and make it possible for sinners to become children of God and have free access to Heavenly Father. God did it. You say, then what do I need to do? Anybody ever wondered, what do I need to do? You accept it. For by grace are you saved through faith. You, oh, that's the truth. What do I have to do? See, because even after we do this, then we start trying to figure out, now what do I have to do? And if you spend your whole Christian life trying to figure out what you have to do, you're trying to do what you think God wants to do you to do. And you know what you've done? You have built a law for yourself. And the problem with, even when you build a law for yourself, the Scripture plainly tells us if you fail in one point of the law, you are a lawbreaker. If you still... Stop the tape. When I was a little boy... My friend Dwight and Paul, my brother, and I went to the Five and Dime store. I think it was called Woolworth on the main street of Jonesboro. Y'all don't tell anybody. Jonesboro people, turn off your TV. Paul and Dwayne stole a 10-cent little black water pistol. They squirted me with it. So you know what I did? I went back and I stole me one. Now remember, that's back when you get one of them little Cokes in a bottle for a dime and you get a big old red juicy delicious apple for a nickel. Uh -huh. So I'm talking a dime, buddy. I could go to the State Theater on Main Street, Jonesboro, beside, beside Cook's Pool Hall, where Mom said you couldn't go because, you know, pool halls, if you go back in the little black and white days, everybody's smoking and gambling in there. Mom said, you can't go to the pool hall. They're gambling in there. I said, they are? What's that? And... Uh, and you could go to the State Theater on Main Street for 15 cents. 15 cents. Get a box of popcorn for a dime. Try that today. You better have more than a water pistol. I stole a water pistol. So you know what I was? What was I? Mm, I was a thief. Mm. Where do thieves go? They go to hell. Collecting on my paper route, Pentecost preacher said, Son, come on up in here. Oh, Lord Jesus. He told me I was going to hell. I said, I, I go to church. He said, I didn't ask you to go to church. Do you know Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior? I said, well, I go to church every Sunday. I've been sprinkled as a baby. He said, Son, you're going to hell. I said, can I have a dollar ten for my paper route? He scared me. Got me right up in the house. Kept me in there for a long time. You know, Pentecostals, they can talk a long time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, said, I was a thief. See, I, I, you know what? When I got saved in 1972, October 26, 1972, in that little cell ministry I had, you know what? I started thinking about, you know what? If you do something, you're supposed to make restitution. If you do something, you're supposed to make confession. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I, now here I am. I've gone from atheist to agnostic to being born again. And all I could think of is I've got to get out of here. I had to go back to Jonesboro. I have to go in that store and say, I was a thief, and, uh, and about 15 years ago, I stole a dime water pistol. With inflation, it's probably worth a dollar. I want to pay for that water pistol. Did I? No. Why? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just, forgive you and the cleanse you all. But that bothered me for a long time. See, I'm feeling convicted right now. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel of God. Amen. What's the gospel of God? If any man confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again, you are saved. Isn't it good to know that your pastor is not a thief? Come on, help me.
<laughs> Aren't you glad you're not a liar? Or did you just lie just now? How many lies do you have to tell be a liar? Do you understand how desperate the law will kill you? Do you, do you understand how when you live, well, 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 yeah, brother, you know, I mean, you know, nobody's perfect. Okay, so what are you imperfect about? Well, this, 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 this. Okay, so uh, are you going to be more spiritual, more dynamic? God's going to answer your prayers if you get rid of those things? Listen, I do not access God because I'm a preacher. I don't access God uh, because I study my Bible. I don't access God because I can pray. You know why I access God? You know how I can go boldly into the throne room of God? Because of this gospel of God that by His blood I have been set free of the old Perry, the thief, the liar, the narcissist. I am free of Him. He is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so uh, we're going to try. I said, told Tommy we're going to cover 17 verses. Tommy, what are we going to do? Two. Which He promised. Oh, man. Could I preach? Come on. Can somebody preach this next verse? This gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Do you under, does anybody know what apologetics are? Well, that's when you do something wrong and you say, I apologize. No. Apologetics, apologetics are, are historical, archaeological facts that prove the Bible to be true. Let me just give you one. In the Bible, we read that the walls of Jericho fell down flat. Did y'all read that? Fell down flat and said they walked right over the walls and went right in and conquered Jericho. For many, many years, they said, well, that's just, that's just a story, that not even historical. There's no archaeological evidence. We've dug and we've dug. We haven't seen any archaeological evidence that that's true. You know, they have never had an archaeological dig that has proven the Bible to be wrong. Some many years ago, a guy's digging, and all of a sudden, he, he starts digging up stuff. And sure enough, there is a pile of bricks around the city, a pile of what was the wall, and it has truly fallen out. Huh. Over and over, they have tried to prove. So what's the best they got? The Big Bang Theory. Since we can't, archaeologic, archaeologically and scientifically, we have never proven the Bible to be wrong about anything. That the sun stood still when Joshua when they prayed and Joshua was in battle. The sun stood still. You know what? They, they haven't ever been able to prove the Bible wrong. You know why? Because the Bible's always right. And so an apologetic is whenever you find something in the Bible and something that is not a Bible scripture, but it is it's said in the Bible, you can dig it right up out of the ground, and there it is. There's your physical evidence. So in this, in this passage of scripture... He tells us this gospel was spoken before by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time here. I've shared this over the last 27 years at least three times. And I'm going to share it again because some of you haven't been here 27 years. Some of you not even been here three times. If you want to understand that Jesus fulfilled hundreds, uh, over 100 scriptures on the day he was crucified, over 100. But if you take the 27 most prominent things that happened from, from a Good Friday to the crucifixion, things like not one bone was broken. They went around, they were going to break his leg so he could not push himself back up on the cross. And he would have suffocated. They got to him, he had already given up the ghost. He's already dead, so they didn't break it. When they put the nails in, they put the nails in right here and went right between the bone. Not one bone was broken. If they would have broken one bone, he could not have paid for our sins because the prophecies in the book of Psalms says not one bone would be broken. So if you took the 27, the 27 most obvious prophecies that he fulfilled in a matter of just 24 to 36, maybe even 48 hours, it would be one man being able to fill that. Let me tell you some things Jesus had no control over where he was born. How can a baby in a womb determine where he's born, what town he's born in? Everybody know where he's born? Bethlehem. Prophetically, the Bible said, hundreds of years before Mary even conceived him by the Holy Ghost, he'd be born in Bethlehem. That he would escape with his family to Egypt as a little bitty boy, had no control. The fact that he was crucified, in order for him to be crucified, which he had to be crucified because that's what the Bible prophesied in Isaiah. Then Romans crucified Jews would stone you. Somebody rebel against their parents, they just take those kids out in the street and stone them. Now kids get stoned. 
big difference in this world, huh? How many of you know if you have five kids, and it's Paula, Paul, Perry, Pat, and Pam. If my brother would have popped off one time to my daddy, he took him out in the yard and stoned him to death, Perry would have been have. I'd have probably never had a cell ministry. I w- my testimony would be totally different. How many of you would agree that if you stoned one of your kids, the other three would probably get a clue? <laughs> so, so the fact that he was crucified, he had no control over that. He had no no. No control over those things. But if you look at the things that took place, the fact that he was crucified, which was a Roman execution, the things that took place, that they put a crown on his head, that they put a sign over his head, had specific things on it, where he was born, all those things. But you take the things he did just in that brief period of time. Peter Stoner, who's a mathematician, said if if Jesus fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled these simple prophecies, 27 of them, Just 27 out of the hundreds. It would be like taking a silver dollar. My grandpa Reed used to send me a silver dollar when I was a little boy until I was about five years old. Me and my brother and sister, we get a silver dollar for our birthday. Wouldn't that be worth something now? OMG. Be worth more than a dollar. He said, You take one silver dollar, paint it red. Take silver dollars, cover the entire geographical service of the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. Take that one silver dollar. Throw it into that pile of silver dollars that covers the entire state of Texas two feet deep. Take a big old Texas-sized stick, because everything's big in Texas, and you stir it all up. How long would it take you to stir Texas? Cowboys die, where do they go? They don't go to Texas. And then he said, reach in and pull out that one silver dollar. How many of you know that's a mathematical and physical impossibility? It's like the, the odds of that are like 10 to the 21st or 27th degree. That means 10 with 21 zeros. Oh, that'd be about our national debt. It's a physical impossibility. It's a mathematical impossibility that one guy could do that. Barring the fact that a baby in a womb has no control over where he's born. So he says... So that's verse number two, which God promised before by his promises and his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So how can we, how can you, how can anybody that you encounter know, well, how do you know the Bible's true? Because let me tell you what God did. God took a couple of thousand years between Adam to Abram and 2,000 years from Abram to Christ and a 400-year gap between the writing of Malachi and the New Testament Gospels. Hi, this is Perry Black, and I want to let all of our viewers know that all of my messages are free, and you can download those at familychurchbryant.org, and I'll see you next week right here on BTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection.